Hi everyone, this is Charlie Melcher. I'm the founder of the Future of Storytelling Summit and we're excited to have you here today for our weekly roundtable uh, conversation. We're incredibly honored to have Lance Weiler here with us today. Welcome Lance. Um, Lance is a uh, filmmaker by training, uh, had done some of the uh, incredible early films, The Last Broadcast and Head Trauma, uh, which were distributed in around the world, I think over 20 countries. Um, and also had the distinction of being one of the first uh, films to be distributed digitally in theaters all the way back in 1988. Oh, 98, 98. I'm sorry, 98, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> um, recently, Lance has been known for um, his, his really innovative storytelling that's outside of the box, kind of unbounded, working cross media, cross uh, different technology platforms. Um, uh, one that you all probably know of and have seen, Pandemic. Um, and then currently a, a really interesting project called uh, Laika's Adventure. Um, Lance, we're, we're so excited to have you here with us. Uh, you're really one of my personal storytelling heroes, uh, future of storytelling heroes. Uh, so, so welcome and thank you for being with us. Uh, thanks so much for having me, Charlie. I'm, I'm really excited to have a conversation about the future of storytelling. Um, so we also have some very illustrious guests, other illustrious guests with us today. Tiffany, why don't you say hi and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Tiffany Schlein. I'm a filmmaker and founder of the Webby Awards and making films in a new way right now that I'm calling cloud filmmaking. Great, welcome. And Yael, welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm Yael Melamed. I'm the founder of Salty Features. I'm a filmmaker, an architect by training. And I'm delighted to be here today. Well, Yael, we should let everyone know, has another kind of recent notch in her belt. Uh, Yael is the, uh, her company is one of the producers of a film called Innocente, which is a documentary film about a uh, young Mexican-American artist, which just won an Academy Award. So, woo, congratulations. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, I should also say that uh, we were very honored to um, feature Innocente, the film, and the artist at the Future of Storytelling Summit this past October, um, where she came and made a painting of the day, and then we were able to make reproductions of that painting and share it with all of our guests afterwards, thanks to our support from FedEx, where we sent everyone the painting and a copy of the film. So our, the first film we featured at FOST ends up winning Academy Award. So I think the message here is that if your <laughs> film is featured at FOST, you're going to win an Academy Award. So I'm finishing my next film now, by the way. <laughs> well, great. So um, I think that this is going to be a, a really fun opportunity for us to talk about the future of not only storytelling, but, but since we've got such amazing uh, filmmakers here in the room today, really talking about the future of cinema. Um, so, so Lance, let me just start by asking you a question. You started as a filmmaker, and you then started to push the boundaries of film, and now you're, you're in territory that's well beyond film, really. T tell me a little bit about how you made that leap. How did you kind of get out of the, the, the confines of the cinematic frame? Well, I, I started to become more interested, I, I guess, in, in terms of the, the way that you could do things with gaming and, and the way that um, you could kind of create something and have it be a little more live, a little more interactive, a little more uh, participatory. And, and I started to feel like um, I had run some alternate reality games and, and all of a sudden I would have larger audiences than I would after I had spent years making a film. And, and I became really kind of excited by that, and, and it was this really kind of this crazy living, breathing organism that, you know, would rise up and do all kinds of crazy things. And, and I, once I kind of tasted that, and all of a sudden you were doing, you know, you were reaching millions of people with something, and, it, and there's real-time elements to it, and, and it has its challenges, it's, uh, it becomes very hard to kind of go back to just something that's a three-act structure or the confines of of, uh, you know, even when I would write for television, you know, writing for commercial breaks, and I became really interested in this idea of the, um, kind of that opportunity to go beyond just one screen and, and kind of make stories more pervasive, and then I think at the same time started to realize that, you know, those formerly known as the audience were actually starting to become collaborators, you know, they felt like they, they were their own media company, media companies anyway, you know, push button publishing for the world to see, whether anybody was watching or not, that was a different story. But um, you know, the the advent of you know just the democratization of a lot of those tools started to change 
the way that I was thinking about stories. Um, and then I just got really into this idea of rapid prototyping and failing quickly and learning from that mm -hmm. failure and, and applying that and seeing what I could learn and, and bringing in certain software methods and open source philosophies into, into what I was doing. And, and from there, it kind of opened up. Boy, has it. <laughs> Um, so tell us a little bit about um, the process now. When you start to uh, start a new story or a new project, uh, how, how do you develop that? I mean, you're, you're not working under traditional uh, narrative constraint anymore. Uh, we'll, we'll do a lot of um, paper testing and iterative design. Um, we'll, we, I, I've mixed a lot. Currently, a lot of the narrative design that I'm doing and, and the work uh, kind of has an element of... Um, uh, story kind of um, you know like narrative design and then also this aspect of um, this aspect of game mechanics and then also the ability to kind of um, capture some design thinking too in terms of how we're thinking about what we do so uh, I, I think it's kind of a, a, a mixture of these different elements that um, have opened up uh, kind of a new thought process in terms of how I'm thinking about the work you know, I'm, I'm really kind of interested in terms of, uh, you know, where's the value proposition live for the audience? You know, how can I make it more engaging for them? And then also to challenge myself to try to keep things more real, more honest in, in terms of the process of making something. And, and to just be more realizing that it's, it's more and more about a conversation than anything else. But I'd say a lot of it has been that idea of, like, where can I find interesting things around design thinking and kind of borrow some of that? You know, where can I find things that come from game mechanics? Where can I find, you know, what I love about storytelling? Uh, so it's a, it's a hybrid. It's a mashup at this point. Hmm. Um, well, so I want to just invite, I, I, w I should have said this in the beginning, but I want to make sure that people who are watching um, this this uh, Google Plus Hangout from home realize that we invite them to share their questions. Uh, so feel free to to write in to our Google Plus page, and we'll try to get your questions engaged in the conversation. Um, so, Tiffany, let me just bring you in, because I, I hear Lance talking a bit about this idea of the participatory audience, you know, the people who formerly known as the audience. Um, and I know in your filmmaking, you've been thinking a lot about, about getting the community involved in the process. Yeah. Tell me a little um, bit about what you're, you're working on. Well. Let's see. I had a feature um, documentary that was at Sundance uh, in 2011 called Connected, and the climax scene was, you know, what's the potential if we have, you know, five billion cell phones on the planet? And um, the last line of the film is, for centuries we've been declaring independence, perhaps it's time to finally declare our interdependence. <clears throat> so I wanted to do an experiment with using... Um, that idea and making a film with people from all over the world. So we wrote a, a declaration of interdependence and we posted it on the internet and we invited people all over the world to read it and videotape themselves. And it was just amazing. We had entries from every continent and just they took our breath away. And um, we cut it into a four minute movie. Moby did the music. We posted it. YouTube featured it on their homepage, which was great on the day after September 11th on Interdependence Day. And we invited people to help us translate it. And then in six weeks, it was translated into 65 languages just by volunteer translators. So it totally blew us away on how we could make a film with people from all over the world that we'll never meet, how they then would help us translate. And then the last part of what we call cloud films is we make free customized versions for nonprofits, so we very easily can change the ending and put any nonprofit's logo in there and their URL. So since we started making these cloud films um, a year and a half ago, we've already made almost 500 free films for nonprofits all over the world. So I've never been more excited <laughs> as a filmmaker. Um, we've now made three, and we've just started making our fourth called The Science of Character. and um, I just never, I feel like the authenticity of people filming themselves is like a rawness that I never could capture if there was a camera person in the room. So to me, it's like it is the future of storytelling in my book. Um, so, so Lance, do you, do you find that to be true? I mean, you're, you're engaging the audience all over the place in the act of creation. Uh, and I know you do that a, a lot right now with children as well. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I think like what, what's really kind of interesting about it is um, the work. You know, at a, at a certain point with um, with filmmaking, you know, you had this moment where you know, kind of prep and uh, production and post kind of all started to merge. And um, now I feel like within the within the work that I'm doing, it's kind of like the design. It's almost like a Mobius strip or something. You know, it's kind of always feeding in back on itself, like a snake eating, eating its tail or something. And what what's uh, kind of interesting about it is I've really become fascinated by this idea of designing with instead of designing for. Um, mm. And in a lot of the instances where we bring in or start to do things with kids, like the way we were around, like his adventure, where you know, we have this plush toy that has a sensor technology in it and she travels the world and she's powered by the imagination of students. We have this, um, we have this kind of, uh, th these data that she's collecting as she goes and it's kind of reinterpreted back to the students and they're deciding where she goes. So they have a, a sense of um, responsibility for her and she has responsibility for them and it's really fascinating. But I think in, in terms of that opportunity, um, it's really kind of, I feel like it's very much at the edge of, the, of, of a new, new form of being able to communicate and tell stories, you know, and, and ironically it kind of returns to a past of where right. people used to kind of sit around a campfire and embellish those stories and, and mash them up and do what they wanted to with them and, and we're finally moving away from this kind of top down to kind of a bottom up. So, you know, in the collaborations that we do with the, the kids, I, I think that those are some of the most amazing you know, creative moments that I, I've had in a long time because they're not confined to a box, you know, they just all of a sudden take it, there, there are no rules for them and it just becomes this moment where they kind of role play with it and they, they go forward and they, they start rapidly creating things and you're like, wow, there's some really amazing stuff that's coming out. And then also we do it a lot with like at-risk, you know, kids and, and kids that are in inner city uh, situations and, and bringing technology to them and, and bringing a world to them and allowing them to do it and we did this really cool story hack um, in Philadelphia in a bad part of Philadelphia um, where we had kids that were 9 to 19 and we brought Laika in and we told her story her hero's journey and turned the kids on to what we were trying to do and, and allowed them to design around it and they they created fashion for her and they built like a space suit and they effectively recorded this amazing song for her they did this interpretive dance to help her understand movement on the planet they told stories about the space and where they were from and 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 all we did was kind of just drop a character in and then another group of them took that character and and threw like Arduinos and sensor technology brought her to life and and we were teaching them physical computing and and the kids really picked up very quickly some of the game stuff that we were doing. We, we did some visual uh, platform-based games that they could, they could use a visual interface to create. So they were learning about physics. And so we were doing this really cool kind of STEM-based learning. You know, it was touching on science and technology, engineering, art, and math. Um, and it was just with these kids that were so marginalized, you know, most of the time that uh, it was really quite amazing, you know, how quickly they picked it up, how the, the stories... And then the passion that was behind them, and 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 things that you would you would see within the way that they were telling them, that was really powerful. And 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 I think um, you know, as, as I go forward in the work, you know, being able to do more of that, being able to help ignite the imagination of many, is is really kind of exciting. You know, I, I know that uh, Wired magazine wrote up Leica's project or adventure as being. The, pro um, the project could become something of a model for education, exposing participants to critical thinking skills and structured creativity that the students will need to be successful in the future. That's a quote from Wired Magazine. So I love this idea that you've been able to take storytelling and an open form of it and engage it into the educational process, right? It's really about uh, using it to help kids learn. Um, have you guys, you're obviously very familiar with the Khan Academy as well and, and some of these other amazing efforts these days to use technology to sort of explode education uh, and, and clearly you're, you're sort of at the forefront of that. Um, well, you know, Code.org is doing some really interesting things and when you look at the, 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 the lack of programming that's taught in schools, it's, it's very, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily taught in very many places. but. There's a, a big conversion that's happening in the United States right now with like uh, metal shops, uh, wood shops that are being converted to maker labs, and there's a really big kind of maker movement. And but I think at the core of what we're trying to do, or at least what I've been really interested in, is this idea of purposeful stories. 
you know, and purpose, purpose, purposeful uh, storytelling, you know, and and how can um, you know that the, the group that we were with, you know, like I'm really interested in this idea of co-entrepreneurship too, you know, like the students uh, from it's called the Village of Arts and Humanities. They they make tiles that then they sell and are used in mosaics by other people. They grow things in their urban garden there, where they use it to make chocolate and to you know they sell it to a chocolate you know maker. They grow flowers that they sell to a local florist, and the florist then exchange back and teaches the kids how to do bouquets or whatever. And just that sustainability side is really fascinating. And I think um, the story is the stories and that ability to for them to be creative is is this moment that's really powerful for them. And I think I think uh, I I think the you know anybody else in this hangout would would agree that when you can kind of tap into something that you know is empowering those people that you're trying to reach, um, it, amazing things can happen, you know, and amazing creative things can happen. And, and it's really just about creating a safe space. It makes me think a little bit of the um, comments that Clay Shirky wrote about in, in Cognitive Surplus about uh, the idea that we were a sort of passive audience just couch potatoes was, a, was an accident of technology and, and timing. Um, and that actually the human spirit wants to be a participatory. They want to be engaged in the stories that they uh, that they receive and tell. Um, a little bit of your idea of designing not just for but with as a storyteller. Um, yeah, I mean, I wonder if anyone else, if if Yael or or Tiffany, have any thoughts about that idea of of creating the story with the audience or with the the subject. You know, we, just to jump in here, we've been doing a lot of interesting stuff with Innocente education-wise. I think for us, we're not, we haven't experimented as much in terms of creating uh, in a collaborative way, but in terms of distribution, we've done things in a very collaborative way that I think is an interesting model and that we've learned so much from. I mean, we started, MTV came on board and Epix came on board early to distribute our film. But since then, we've developed these arts education workshops with the film, and we've taken them to museums and to different community centers. And we've basically shown the film to, to students, to teenagers, and, um, and then they've created art that directly comes from the film. So we've had these beautiful workshops that quote lines from the film, and then kids have made self-portraits based on those lines and the, and the poetry that they write. And seeing that come together is really beautiful. They have a way of putting their emotion onto paper, and we're trying to figure out ways of sharing all of that work between people. So I think there's a whole side of participatory watching that is really interesting. I think there's something about curation that is still really important in order for stories to have their ultimate impact. So I'm not yet there about collaborating entirely in the making because because I'm a control freak, but anyway. Um, <laughs> but I think on the distribution front, I'm a big fan of using documentary films much more in the educational arena, and we have found with Innocente at least that there's incredible potential for engaging people and really moving them and, and changing them and sharing the work that they do as a result that's very exciting. I, I, think, uh, I think one thing, and I know, Tiffany, you do this a lot in your work, you know, in, in terms of the way that your you the engagement the way that you kind of get it out you eventize it you, you kind of bring it into spaces and you get people really kind of excited about it and and I think that there's an element of where I think sometimes when people think about the creation they think about it in terms of the creation of the story but then you know and, uh, and Tiffany I'd be interested to hear if, I think I already know the answer to this but that that idea of where everything becomes part of the creative process right you know like it's creative all the way across it can you can you speak to that because I that's how yeah. I take it when I see your stuff. Yeah, I mean, to me, like, a tweet is a creative process. Like, every step, you know, we engage. So we're doing a call for uh, entries right now for our new film. We're inviting people to send in artwork and videos. And the email to engage them to do it is the part of the art. Our exchanges are part of the creativity. And then making it, and then when they help us translate, and then making versions for them. So I just, and the events. So... To me, even Facebook posts, like, I when I make a film, then I deconstruct the film, and I'm really trying to get ideas out into the world. That's mostly my goal. Like, 
in this new film, we want people to think about how they're empowered to change their character and share a lot of science. A lot of my films, my goal is to kind of make science accessible. I did a film about neuroscience last and child brain development, and I want to kind of figure out a, a creative way to share, let's set these ideas free into the world. So I, to I absolutely think all the steps along the way are the create. I mean, I also think living is like living a good life is critical. I don't, I take the weekends off, I unplug with my family. Like, that's critical to me. That's part of the creative process because on Saturdays, I have no technology and I write in my journal and I get my hands in the garden and I bake bread and I'm with my family. I don't know. I guess I just feel like living is just a creative process if you look at it that way and everything you do is is that is that if that makes sense it's a great message um, the, the one thing uh, that I wanted to add to that uh, I think I've been really kind of excited about is this idea of um, kind of making use of data and, and, and kind of sensor based technologies to, mm -hmm. to help better you know help people better understand the world around them and uh, to design things that are kind of qualitative and quantitative you know so you can actually see the results and, and uh, a lot of times when people think about data initially in terms of storytelling they think about it in, 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 in ways that it would greatly affect like the outcome of the story or what the characters do but I'm, I'm more interested in, in, in these really kind of exploratory ways and, and how it can help to kind of visualize or extend the world. Uh, when we did some stuff with Pandemic, we were, we were using it as a, a way to model off of actual Pandemic data to, to, you know, to do something with what effectively was public health messaging. Uh, but, at the, but it delivered like a genre kind of message at the same time. So I'm really interested in like, can you do stuff that's like broad-based uh, in terms of its entertainment um, uh, be able to deliver like a really quality kind of story, but then layer in these other things. And I'll give you a case in point. Like uh, I've been working to develop a story design lab at Columbia, where I teach a, a I teach uh, there. And the story design lab is is all about purposeful storytelling, and it's about using data, and it's about designing with. and And we did a pilot for it last fall, and we did this really interesting thing where I connected with this NGO called Orange Duffel Bag, and Orange Duffel Bag works with kids who are aging out of foster care. And uh, there's, a, there's a real issue where a lot of those kids end up either homeless or incarcerated, addicted to drugs or, or whatnot, and only 3% go on to higher education. And um, what was really interesting about it is um, um, when they told me the stories, it sounded like science fiction. It didn't sound like it was real. And so I thought, wow, it would be really interesting to design something that was a sci-fi kind of immersive experience. And so the graduate students worked in conjunction with foster care kids who were close to aging out or had aged out. And together they built this immersive experience that people could go through. And then I worked in conjunction with a group called the Harmony Institute because my, my creative teams have totally changed. You know, I have data researches, researchers that I work with, you know, creative technologists that I work with. And so like the creative process, even on that side, in terms of the collaborators that I'm working with, have changed. And what was interesting is um, the project, we ran it for the public, and now we've been talking to uh, folks in the state of California and the state of uh, Florida to implement that experience, because what it does is when you go through it, it's science fiction, but you realize that everything that you experience within it are these emotional beats that kids who are aging out of foster care experience every day. And so in California and Florida, they're talking about using it as a framework as a way to kind of educate social workers and um, potential foster care parents and judges, lawyers, all these people that touch into these kids' lives as a, as a way to help them better understand that emotional journey. Um, and then we were just recently asked to, to bring it in and do it at a special UN event. So here's this thing that started, you know, just in a classroom, didn't really have any budget, was co-designed by graduate students and these foster care kids and it's going all the way to something that's at the UN. And, and I think what's really powerful about that for the kids, it became this thing of where it was almost this cathartic release, this, this opportunity to create and tell stories in a really cool way. Um, and so I think the more that I kind of think about the notion of what it is to tell stories, the more it becomes about, um, you know, helping other people to be big, become better storytellers, I think, in some sense. 
Yeah, we're uh-huh. doing. We're. Uh, I'm an executive producer on a film called When I Walk that um, premiered at Sundance just recently, and it's about a guy who um, uh, was diagnosed with MS, and he turned the camera on himself, and um, and four years into it, he meets this extraordinary woman, and it becomes a love story. But one of the things I love about that film is that beyond the film itself. There's this incredible app that he and his wife have developed that's about going out into the world and actually figuring out what is accessible and what isn't. And there's a scene in the film that we're now taking out into the real world that I think can be, that is so powerful where you see a bunch of people come in and they're going to test the app that they've developed. And as they leave the house, they kind of look bored. They don't know what they're doing. And as they leave the house, um, Alice, who's, who's uh, Jason's wife, says, you know, you can use Jason's wheelchair and you can use his scooter. And they go out and they become so animated because they realize all of a sudden, oh my God, to be in a wheelchair or to be in a scooter, I had no idea. And so we've been talking to these not-for-profits about doing community building events where you bring in a hundred people and a hundred wheelchairs and a hundred helpers and everybody goes out and documents, you know, a block or three blocks. And I think the power of relating to the film, but also doing something in the world is so powerful. And the potential of that to me is extraordinary. And we're taking that into the next film that we're producing about dishonesty. We're trying to find a platform where people can share everyday lies. And it's incredibly exciting. (laughs) <laughs> so, um, so I, I, I think, you know, for me, again, I'm, I'm not quite there yet um, in, in terms of the collaborating in the, in the actual making, but I think in terms of the impact and taking things out into the broader world, um, engaging as many partners early on is so helpful and working with bigger teams is really helpful because there's just so much man, more manpower and woman power to bring to, to these activities. Um, so I, I'm, I'm really inspired by by those possibilities. So, so I have a question for this group. So we all know that stories have traditionally enabled us to see the world from the eyes of others, right? to give us a little bit of insight into the other. And do you think that the technologies that are coming on into our lives today, how are those changing our abilities to understand the other, to give us different types of insight? insight? Is it, is it fundamentally altering it? Is it just enhancing what stories have well, always done? I feel like the um, we were such a, a text-based culture for so long. And with the rise of the image and now video, which can just be such a connection and give more empathy, <clears throat> that I think that text could never give in the same way. So I'm, on my more positive days, I feel like, mm-hmm. you know, we are becoming more empathetic because we are hearing other people's stories directly on YouTube and Facebook. And, you know, um, hardships bring people together, you know, and, and I think that, um, and, and revealing something that's difficult. And I'm, I'm kind of very much noticing a trend on Facebook where I think it's not, it, when Facebook first came along, it was like, this attempt at projection of this life, it wasn't very real. But I find people are getting a lot more real on Facebook. Um, And this is not any big study. This is just my (laughs) perception. And I think when people are more real, it's only a good thing. You know, I I lost my parent. I'm feeling bad about this. Or, you know, just to see the dialogue that happens. And um, I think sharing on that level can only lead to a more empathetic world. Yeah, but I think there's a lot of clutter. I think there's there's so much. I think one of the problems we I certainly face is that there's so much information out there, and being able to know what to listen to, and oftentimes the most dramatic or the most um, polarized information gets the most attention. Yeah, so I, I agree with you. I think there's so much rich information out there. And I, you know, these last films and projects that we're doing that are documentary that are really different for us because we came from narrative have really inspired us to figure out how to, how do you get people to listen to the non-polarized, non-kind of, yeah. mo- you know, mo- more dramatic material. Well, and one note on that, which I've been trying to be really mindful of, is curation. Like, I've been unfollowing a lot of lists and people that I don't feel like are adding to my brain flow. Um, just after making a whole film 
and writing a book about the brain. You know, everything affects your brain. And, in, and that's not to say to live in a bubble, because I follow people I don't agree with that I find very provocative, but I've really curated who I'm following because it was too much and it wasn't what I wanted to be my streams of consciousness and streams of thought, which is an interesting way to look at it. But I, I think you, your work, Yael, I mean, and Lance, like, both of you are putting such beautiful work into the Internet. You know, I mean, that's what it's all about is there's a lot of crap out there and there's a lot of polarizing and negative stuff and the more kind of impactful and important stories that we can put in all these different mediums, the better. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I mean, I, I think in terms of the clutter, in terms of just there being such a sheer amount of volume of stuff, I mean, I think um, that, you know, that, that's something that's just a byproduct of the democratization of those tools, you know, and the commoditization of those tools. And, and I think, if anything, it challenges you more. And, and I've been finding myself making more analog bridges, you know, and building more things that are actually have value in the real world, and then using technology as an enhancement to connect people. You know, I, I'm really fascinated by this design principle of this idea of you know, hyper-local things that then can be global at the same time. And, and finding ways to have people feel something, you know, uh, connect with the emotional core of it, but feel like they're involved in a collaborative act to do something. Because I think a lot of times people, when I, when I talk about the idea of co-creation or the collaborative thing, they, they think inherently that I'm just opening it up and I'm saying, okay, here's the script and everybody go and write whatever you want to write here or do whatever you want to do here. There's an orchestrated kind of design to it. There's like an architecture to it and there's a way in which you're kind of, it's ebbing and it's flowing and it's changing over time and you're figuring out the right place to allow people into the process and then you're reevaluating oh. that and you're coming back to it. It's like a dance. It's like, it's like playing jazz or something. It's like improv right? And uh, Lance, I love the... That is such a great, because a lot of people say the same thing to me, well, I couldn't open up, and I think they have this vision that we're just letting people, like, everyone just creates a movie or a thing, and I'm like, oh my god, we have the tightest script. <laughs> the exact moments but, of infusing humanity, but it is like the tight, and then we edit the shit out of it. I mean, like, <laughs> it's so funny what people think when I say we're making these collaborative cloud films, because knowing the moments... You know, somebody called me yesterday, I want to make a cloud film where everyone says, solves the problems, and it was so open, and I just, I didn't want to rain on their parade. I said, that is going to be very difficult to do. But you guys, I'd love, I'd love to hear from you how you, because I'm so curious about that curation, you know, how early it happens, how much what the material that you get influences your creative process versus kind of the thoughts you have that, and I'm sure it's a growing process, but I'd love to hear more about that because I think that curation is so key and that I think it's so key to telling good stories because people do think, you know, you just take the information out there and it's all free and it's all good, but I think what you guys do, which is so extraordinary, is the, is the actual curation and putting it together. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about that creative process. Well, I think in terms of the work that we do, um, it's really kind of about spending a lot of time with the why. You know, why, why are we telling this? And then eventually you make your way to the how. And if you spent the time with the why, then you understand all the different ways that you can put it out into the world. And so right there, you, you know, we'll spend a lot of time with, um, you know, um, putting together materials that help people to better understand how to play within the worlds that we build. Um, a very simple example was when we did Like as an Adventure, we created um, a gal we had a gallery element where people came to realize that Leica was powered by creativity and passion. You know, they thought the robot would come from another planet and crashed here. At first maybe it was fossil fuel or it was some alternative energy, but then they realized it was actually creativity and passion. And, and so people could print out two different versions of the robot, one that they could color on, you know, and another that they could just make as a little robot out of tape and they could tape it together or glue it together. But the robot had common traits because I knew when it was in a gallery, I wanted, there were going to be all different contributions, but I knew that I wanted to have similar design traits across it. So you would see her smile, you would see her heart, you would see her antenna. So when you looked at it, even though it was all this different stuff, it had a consistency across it. And that's a really simple example, but that, those were really powerful because I had been contacted by uh, a woman who was a teacher in New Jersey who worked with autistic kids and um, they had used the coloring book ones to write something they were passionate about in the heart and then they took those 
those those robots that they drew on or colored and took it to the library and matched it to a book and they all took out their own books for the first time you know and it was this powerful thing but then when you saw all of them no matter if it was from those kids or different kids from all over the world there was a consistency so I think in a lot of it is like once you know the why and why you're doing things within it then you start to look for ways that you can help people be better storytellers in what you're doing and then the more that you lay out and you're clear about the communication of what you're asking and what you want people to do and you encourage them, then if you put those foundations in there, people will kind of strive to make better work because they see that everybody else is doing better work. And so a lot of it is kind of giving them the tools and then empowering them, but finding the right places to do it within the process. Yeah, we're, we're on this line project that we're doing, we're trying to find a safe space and it's kind of become, because I come from an architecture background, I've been wanting to do these design competitions about what a secular confessional booth would look like. I <laughs> love um, that. <laughs> do that. That's so we're thinking about that. But, it's, <laughs> but it is an, it's an incredible process, kind of drawing people in and, and, and the stories that we've been hearing that are not yet within booth scenarios, are, whatever those will are, be. Are you trying... Are you trying to get people, is, the subject of the film is dishonesty or lying? I mean, how are you, what's your, how are you coming into well, it's, that? It's based on the work of a behavioral economist by the name of Dan Ariely. We've been collaborating for a while. His last book is called The Honest Truth About Dishonesty, How We Lie to Everyone, Especially Ourselves. So it is at the core that we like to judge people so much as, and when I was talking about polarized, you know, we, we like to think they're good people and bad people, or that's how it's so often presented in the news. And when people who we, um, who we think so highly of fail, we love to kind of trample all over them. And this is kind of giving people a little bit of a chance to, to talk about how things happen. And I think our goal is to say, look, if we were in the same situations, a lot of us could probably land in the same place. So, but we've, as in the process, we've been collecting people's everyday lies and the, the project right now is called Slippery Slopes and it's about how those, those become bigger lies. And I have to tell you, everyday lies, I could sit and listen to them all day long. They're just <laughs> extraordinary. So well, it, sounds, it sounds like the counterpoint to the character film I'm making, we should talk offline. <laughs> <laughs> character, like there's the dishonesty film. <laughs> yes. Like, I love that idea. And, and we can partner on outreach, which I think is more and more important. You know, counterpoint, point and counterpoint in, in parallel. Absolutely. Cool. I was just saying, uh, I love that idea of, a, of a, um, a booth where you can lie, you know, the opposite of a truth confessional. Well, it is actually called the truth booth, so, but, um, but we'll, we'll see. It's, um, so far, it's wait, been wait absolutely second. fantastic. Wait. Were you saying, wait, I want to make sure I understand this. Charles, you were saying there would be a booth that you can lie, but yeah, no, no, no. you're building a new these are No, these are confessions of lies. That's what I so thought. Is, okay, yeah, yeah. I like your idea too, Charles. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. You just sit so, in there and tell lies. Yeah, that'll, that'll be the lying booth. That'll be the lying yeah. booth. And then again, it'll be point and counterpoint. <laughs> But, but I think that there was something really interesting that you two just did right there, which is that idea of being able to find that interplay between worlds and between the stories that you create, and that, you know, whether it manifests itself in a way that is promotional, but the ability to kind of extend each other's projects is really yeah. fascinating, you know, because I think a lot of times what ends up happening is people kind of work in a vacuum, and they go out and they kind of create something, they do it themselves, and they kind of make it perfect, and or the hope that it's perfect and they kind of push it out into the world but what's really interesting about that idea of it becoming more collaborative even even amongst the practitioners is really exciting because uh, the way that Charlie said oh well maybe it's a lying booth and all of a sudden you start to see like a whole other tangent kind of emerge you know and and I think that that I, I hope that there's more of that type of work because well, I, I think, think it can be facilitated now. I think there definitely is and actually they've been doing studies about you know that more oxytocin is being released like <clears throat> every text and email and tweet little bursts of oxytocin which is the bonding and love hormone and basically the collaboration hormone which it makes me think that's why we're seeing so much the rise of collaboration in business I mean and artwork and all of this the ride share and collaborative art and and um I imagine that the three of us will eventually do something together. Like I have no doubt in my mind. Yell and I have been wanting to do something together. I feel like we we've been fans of each other for a while, 
And Lance and I, from the early days of all of this conversation, there was like five filmmakers like five or six years ago that did a conference where we were talking about this. And it feels like now, Lance, doesn't it feel like now, like it's real, like it's all, all the stuff we were talking about years ago is finally kind of, you know. So it's like, uh, it's a fabulous time to be alive, basically. And but don't leave me out. I want to join. Yeah, join. Oh, <laughs> but I think it, you're the orchestrator bringing us all together. <laughs> no, no, I want to be a collaborator. But it's also it's also a necessity. You know, it's not only that it's cool. I think it's yeah. this this has well, become a necessity for getting these stories not just out into the world, but for them to have an impact. And I think it's for me. It's funny that I learned so much on a short film like Innocente in terms of getting it out into the world. Um, it's it's uh, astonishing. So, I, I I and I think we I think it's lessons that I will take into narrative filmmaking as well. It's not just that it applies to documentaries. I think it applies to storytelling in general. We have to be on different formats and different venues and live and online and all all kinds. And it's challenging. It's really challenging. Yeah. But I think thinking about the story, I always think about the thing you're making. And this is before I was making collaborative films, but even the films themselves, that's like step one. And then how you let that thing interact with the world is the second whole part. And so many filmmakers, they just focused on the making, and then they hope someone would buy it and do something with it. And it's like, who's going to do something with it if you're not thinking of creative ways for people to play with it? Um, so... And I know, um, Charles, I mean, you were an early pioneer with thinking about the way that books were rethought of. And I mean, it just feels like how people engage with the story or with the ideas is like, that's what it's all about. That, you call it out. It's funny that it's called outreach because that feels one directional. It's not really outreach to me. It's like this inner read. You know, it's this inter dialogue you're having with people, you know. Well, listen, this inter-dialogue could go on for a long time, and I would be very happy if we did. Uh, but because we have been trying to keep these to a strict limit of about 45 minutes, I'm going to say we're out of time, which, again, is a nice social lie. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to thank you all so much for coming and joining this conversation. It was really fun. Um, I want to encourage people to come visit the Future of Storytelling website, which is just futureofstorytelling.org. And I hope to see all of you guys back at FOSS this October uh, for the summit. Uh, and I'm just so honored and excited to, to be in a, a chat room with all of you uh, today. So thanks for coming. And, and join us uh, on our weekly roundtables. You're all invited back anytime. Uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you guys soon. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thanks a lot, Charlie. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.